Now, being honest, who here just loves the cold weather that we're having? I really thought I'd get at least one, I think a ball. Yeah, there, okay, Zach loves it. I found myself complaining about this weather quite a lot the last couple of days. Uh, Kathy has to bear the brunt of that, that's my wife. But I always then remind myself, this is winter, this is Canada, this is what I've signed up for. But Calgary is a unique beast altogether. I've lived in Calgary my whole life. Do we have anybody else who has been in Calgary your whole life? Okay, so you guys will not have made the mistake that I did. You will have done better. I went to bed one September night a few years ago. Needed to go to school the next morning. I was all prepared. Woke up at about 7 o'clock expecting to see the sun shining in through my partially open blinds. And instead, I was greeted with a blanket of snow. And not the light, fluffy snow you can kick with your feet or blow off your car. This was the heavy, dense snow that'll break your wipers if you try to use it to wipe your uh, windshield. This was snow timber, if you remember. The road crews were either caught unaware or nobody wanted to pay for them to clear the roads. And I had to get to school. Now one thing that you learn about me is that I like to be strategic with my money, which means if my tires don't need to be replaced, I don't replace them. And what that means is in the summer, my tires were great. And if it would have been a regular September, the tires on my car would have been great. But as I woke up that September morning, I had a dilemma. Take my car on Stony Trail all around the city to get to my school in the southeast or southwest, or call in sick, skip the day, and take that, um, that tuition ding, because students know exactly how much each, each class room session costs. And as I, I looked out the window, I decided I was, I'm a Calgarian. I've done it my whole life. I've driven in winter for 12, at least 12 years. I'm going to go. So I got in my car, and I struck out into the unknown, unaware of what awaited me. Now, fast forward a couple of years to last week, and our lead pastor, Peter, was standing right here during his sermon, and he challenged all of us to, instead of to making New Year's resolutions, to find purpose, purpose in the mission of God this year, to join with God in some, some way that was very um, relevant and applicable to us to listen to God and to join with him in, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our city, country, or, and some of us even to the ends of the earth. This is an audacious goal that's been passed on to us. And like anything in life, without the proper preparation, it is doomed to fail. And that's where I want to set you up when we come to our passage. We will be reading from Mark 9, verse 14. Before we get there, you can pull that up in your Bibles. Before that, I want to remind you of last week, Rick, or two weeks ago, Rick shared with us the transfiguration. This is the turning point, kind of like the climax almost of the book of Mark, where Jesus' disciples have started to figure out who he is, and Jesus, at this mountaintop experience, sees Moses and Elijah. Three of his disciples are lucky enough to witness this incredible encounter and it must have totally transformed them because all Gospels, all of the Gospels make a reference to this moment and even it's, it's referenced at least two or three times throughout the New Testament. This moment where Jesus was transformed into a glowing figure where they had a little glimpse of the true glory that Jesus has as God. And then Jesus and his disciples descended the mountain. And, and Jesus knew he wasn't just walking back down to join his other disciples. He was walking towards the cross. And that is where we find ourselves in Mark 9, verse 14. When they went to join the other disciples, they saw a large crowd gathered. And teachers of the law were arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were filled, they were overwhelmed with wonder, and they ran out to greet him. 
What are you arguing with them about? Jesus asked. A man from the crowd said, Teacher, I brought my son. Um, I brought my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth. I brought him to your disciples so they could drive him out, but they couldn't. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus said. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a violent convulsion. It threw him to the ground. He foamed at the mouth, gnashed at the teeth, and became rigid. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, the father replied. It often seizes him and throws him into fire or water to kill him. If you can do anything, please have pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, anything is possible for the one who believes. The boy's father immediately exclaimed, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of this boy and never return. The spirit shrieked, threw the boy into a violent convulsion, and left. The boy was so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive him out? And Jesus said, this kind can only come out by prayer. Why were the people overwhelmed by Jesus' appearance? Jesus is a big deal. Jesus draws crowds everywhere he goes. He is, he is a celebrity unto himself in this world. But why were the people overwhelmed with wonder? Those are strong words. Overwhelmed with wonder when they saw Jesus. This is drawing from some Old Testament uh, stories. So it's an Old Testament illusion, and it's reminiscent of Moses, who was pictured on the left earlier. Moses, who set up a tent just outside of Israel's camp, and it was known that you could go to this tent if you ever wanted to meet with God. They called it the tent of meeting. Other people could go there and, and um, seek the Lord's will. But when Moses went, everybody would get up and stand at their doors and they would watch. Because as Moses walked to the tent, this cloud that had followed Israel everywhere in their wilderness, we called it the cloud of presence, this cloud would descend on that tent, just for Moses. And Moses would speak with God face to face. And then we hear later in Exodus, that was Exodus 32, and in Exodus 34, we're told that when Moses would leave these encounters, his face would be glowing. So much so that the people demanded he veil his face because they couldn't stand to see him this way. He was in the presence of God and he had a physical manifestation of it when he left. And this, we think, is what is going on with Jesus. He is um, revealed this glory. He's been in the presence of God on the mountain and he is glowing with it. And as he comes down, the people witness this and, and they're completely, completely overwhelmed. Now, this father, I th um, this father, let's empathize with him for a moment. His fa this son has a spirit that triggers epilepsy, something very similar to epilepsy. This doesn't mean that epilepsy is a demonic, um, this doesn't mean it's demonic, but it does mean that this demon is somehow able to push the right buttons in this boy's brain to trigger this reaction. And this father has lived with this the boy's entire life. 
Does he have a mother? We don't know. She isn't, she's not present. So I guess we can't comment one way or the other. But we know this father has taken it on himself to take care of his son, to protect his son from the fire and water and all the dangers that he's facing. And this father is so desperate that he has traveled because he heard rumors of Jesus. Rumors of a miracle worker who can heal. And so Jesus' rebuke is very surprising, to say the least. Hasn't this father demonstrated his faith by journeying, by finding the disciples, by bringing his boy to Jesus? And haven't the disciples demonstrated their own faith by attempting to cast out this demon in the same way they've done it previously all throughout the book of Mark? I think this father is in a very similar place to a lot of us. We have faith that God can act, and we want to see him act, but we are held back by part of us, the unbelief that we have. This I like to call the disease of practical atheism. We obviously believe in God. We're not atheists. But at times we do not believe that God will move. We don't believe that God will take serious the prayers that we bring to him. And we don't expect him to act. We pray, we don't expect answers. We go through the motions. This is a double-minded approach to faith. And it is very dangerous. It dilutes our faith. It immobilizes us, puts us on the sideline in the mission of God. It makes us inept. And what's worse is that it lowers our standard for faith and then we just accept it. And I say the disease of practical atheism because it spreads. It's infectious. We can bring others down with it. Soon, this leads to us abandoning our prayer life altogether because if you don't believe that God is going to act, why would you ask him to do anything? And if you find yourself in this place today, and if we're being honest, a lot of us do, like this father, have some unbelief. I have some good news. Jesus doesn't rebuke the man's unbelief. Instead, he gives him a reason to believe gives him a reason to believe by releasing his son from the oppression he's been under for his entire life. And later, when Jesus' disciples get him alone, they ask him what, he was, what they were doing wrong. Jesus' Jesus's answer is very straightforward and simple. This kind can only come out by prayer. I'm not going to categorize demons and, and really try to go into what this kind means. What I do find interestingly enough, missing from this story is the prayer. When did Jesus pray to drive out this demon? He didn't. There's no moment where he said, pray to himself or pray to God, please cast out this demon. I think that's because Jesus is not referring to momentary prayer requests, that, as if it was some kind of a formula that we use in the moment to persuade God but he is referring back to his prayer life. The consistent, routine, scheduled prayer life that Jesus has. We've seen that he rises before the sun, which in the Middle East is about 6 a.m. probably. Rises before the sun so he can get in his time with his father in solitude before he goes about his ministry in his daily life. E.M. Bounds, who was a 19th century preacher, once said that our, our short, quick, momentary prayers draw their effectiveness from our long, deep, um, soul-moving prayer sessions with God. Is your prayer life only short, momentary prayers before dinner, Maybe a short prayer when you need something from God. Or do you have a deep pool of time that you can draw from? Time when you sit with God in worship, in adoration, in reflection, in intercession. All of these different forms of prayer that we have. Is your prayer life lopsided? 
and it's just these little requests that come up with circumstance. Ian Bounds isn't a, he's not giving us a formula for prayer, but his point is that our prayers, the little requests, are more effective when they are anchored in a life of prayer. So as we set out to make an impact for the kingdom this year, we need to be prepared beforehand by cultivating our own prayer life. If we don't, we risk diluting our faith, living with this unbelief in this double-minded approach, and it will cause us problems. It will immobilize us, like I said, on the sidelines. So you remember snow timber. I got in my car. I'm doing fine. I'm driving down Stony Trail. I get to the hill of Stony Trail westbound, passing Shaganapi. I have now learned that this is a notorious intersection, and especially the exit on Sarsi often gets shut down during snowstorms. I didn't know that. As I'm coming up the hill, I feel my tires starting to slip. I'm losing momentum. And unfortunately, it's bumper to bumper the whole way. And so I have, I have a decision to make. I already made one bad decision today. Am I going to make a second bad one? I just have to decide, am I going to continue going and quite possibly get stuck, lose all traction and get stuck on Stony Trail in the middle of rush hour? Or do I try to safely ditch and sit on the, the shoulder until traffic dies and then take my unprepared vehicle home. So in the moment I decided I would much rather feel the shame of sitting on the side of the road with my hazards on as opposed to be the one who is blocking traffic. And so I safely exited onto um, the Sarsi ramp and sat there with my blinkers uh, while traffic cleared. I sat there reflecting on my foolish decision to go out on the road unprepared. As you go out into the world, as you go out to your work, with your families, with your friends, it is my job here to make sure that you are prepared. That you're prepared for this mission of God that you are going into. And part of that is dealing with the unbelief that we still have. And I have three, three tips. Three, three tips that I want to give to you. I want you to take these and work these into your life. This first one is to find Christians with the gift of faith. Practical atheism is a disease that is contagious. Faith is even more contagious. When you pray with someone who has the gift of faith, it is truly a special moment. When you pray with someone who beyond the shadow of a doubt believes that God is listening and is going to answer, it is magical. There, and it will rub off on you. Paul tells us there are some people who have been given the gift of faith. This comes out of 1 Corinthians 12. He mentions it a couple other times. It says, to some, this much faith has been given to others. They've been given less or more. Some of us have an easier time believing that God is truly going to come through in an astounding way. And you need people like that in your prayer life. You need examples like that in your prayer life. You need people who have honed their prayers through experience, through just a supernatural gifting of the Holy Spirit. You need people who can inspire you in your prayers. And if you are someone who this comes easily to, if you think that you have the gift of faith, then your role in our community is to help inspire that with amongst everybody else you see here today. If you've been given the gift of faith, it's not just for you to enjoy. It's for you to infect others with it. You have the opportunity to help people overcome their unbelief as you let the Spirit work through you in our church community. Tell your stories. Share what God is doing. And as you do this, you will inspire others. And you will help them 
like this father to overcome their unbelief. Second, establish a prayer routine, both in solitude and in community. You have a, both a private and a public prayer life, whether or not you've, you're using either. And you need to spend time in both. We need time alone, like we said with, with Edward M. Bounds. We need time alone with God, which will feed into our private or into our public prayer lives. We need a good balance of both. God moves when his people get together and pray. And so public prayer is essential. But we are deeply transformed in our private time with God. And if you do not create a routine, the chances are you will not stick to it. We make routines for everything that we find important in life. You probably have a morning routine you go through before you go to work or before you go on with whatever else you do with your day. You probably wake up around the same time. You probably shower in a similar way. You do these because these are important. Everything is important. You don't want to miss any of it. Prayer is the same. If we do not work it into a routine, we will probably neglect it. And then it is scary to see how long we can go before realizing, I haven't spent time in prayer. This routine, though, is not just for you alone. You need time with other Christians. If you have a spouse, you need time with them. And all of this needs to be structured in a way where your already overburdened and busy lives can handle. So you might need to cut something out. Create a prayer routine. Find something that is realistic that you can commit to. Because the number one reason New Year's resolutions are abandoned is that people overcommit. They, they try to shoot for the moon when really all they should be doing is trying to drive around the block. So find something that is realistic for you and start to build your way up. Edward M. Bounds probably prayed for at least three hours in the morning before he got out to do any work. I'm not saying that's what you should do. It took him a lifetime to develop his prayer life to get to that point. You need to be realistic about where you are and create that space. If you don't do this, you will be underprepared for the temptations and for the unbelief that faces you in life. And like a seed planted in shallow soil, your faith will die from a lack of sustenance. Lastly, keep track of your prayer requests so that you can see when God provides for you. We can pray and pray and pray, but if we are not looking to see if God is answering, it will not feed into our faith. It will not develop our sense of trust. God has promised to answer our prayers, but if we don't look for those answers, we will miss them. So get out a journal. Write it down. When it, when it is answered, cross it off so that six months later you can look back in, in a moment of unbelief where you are doubting whether or not God will listen or God will act. You can look back and see what he has already done. When you read the Old Testament, you see God is constantly telling people to set up altars. Pile up, uh, set up piles of stones as a monument so you can remember what the Lord your God has done. We can do these and we don't need stones. We just need a simple journal that keeps track of what we have requested and what God has responded with. And as those requests are answered, I can't emphasize this enough, tell other people. We, as a community, can support each other. We can point each other to Christ and we can in, kind of inflame a passion for God by sharing what God is doing and how he is coming through for us. And as I hear the story that you share, maybe then I will have a little more faith to believe that God can overcome what I'm facing. And in this way, we as a community hold each other up and we provide a pastoral service to each other as we point each other back to God. So there I was, sitting on the side of the road, unable to gain traction on that slushy ice that was gathering. 
I was stuck there until a police officer came along after traffic had died down and pushed my car back onto the road. I think that there are some of us here who are spinning our tires in our spiritual life, unable to gain traction, unable to go anywhere. We want to join Jesus in his work for the kingdom here and now, but we are held back by our fears of inadequacy, our doubts, and our self-defeating thoughts that tell us it just isn't worth trying. And we just need a little push to get going again. So my word to you echoes what Jesus said to the Father. This kind can only come out by prayer. The only way to deal with our unbelief is through prayer. And we know that our prayers will be heard because we have an advocate in heaven who stands at the right hand of the Father, interceding, pleading with God on our behalf. And that is what we celebrate as we come to communion. So I'm going to invite uh, whoever's passing to come down and get ready for that. We know that our prayers are heard because the Lamb who was slain is now in heaven with the Father, praying, in a sense, for us. So as we come to communion today, I want you to take some time and reflect on the cross, the Lamb, and really the position of privilege we have now with a God who stands beside us.